January 2011, Gavin Andreessen, uh, the former head developer of Bitcoin, comes to Keene, New Hampshire, wants to have lunch with me and my business partner, Ian Freeman. We host a nationally syndicated radio program called Free Talk Live. He now calls that the most lucrative lunch of his life. He paid for his meal by giving me some uh, 45 Bitcoin. They were 27 cents back then. I've still got half of them. I lost half in the My Bitcoin Wallet debacle. So there you go. From uh, 37, 27 cents to 20,000 down to what the hell we're at, 3,600 or whatever. Our next guest needs no introduction. He is an Emmy Award winning uh, host. He has won an Edward R. Murrow Award, which is a really big deal for those of you who don't know. And, well, he has a really unique news outlet. I think you've probably seen one of his videos. It's Ben Swan. Ben. <laughs> doesn't, doesn't his hair look great? Every time I see Mark, he's, he's doing something new to try to deal with the green, but um, I, you're rocking it, man. It looks pretty good. I, I gotta compete with your greatness. <laughs> Listen, the, the hair, you gotta, just, you gotta treat it like a, like a whole other project, all on its own. You gotta treat it carefully. Um, hey, how are you guys doing this morning? Yeah, you guys doing good? It's hot today, huh? Man, it's hot. They told me I was way too dressed up for this. I was like, I agree, I'm sweating like, like crazy up here, but that's okay. Uh, I'm really excited to be here with you and to talk with you this morning. The biggest reason that I really wanted to be here today, wanted to, to come and, and be a part of this 2019 Anarchapuco, is because um, last year I was here as well, and it was the very first uh, time I was in, in attendance at this event, but also the first time I was able to talk about a, a connection between crypto and independent media, uh, and then, so much has changed in a year. So much has developed in my understanding of things and, and the, the kind of the dream and the focus and all that. We're gonna get into all that in a few minutes. How many of you guys were here last year? Raise your hand just so I know. Okay, so about maybe a third of you, good. So, so the rest of you, this is your first time ever at Anarchapulco, raise your hand. Wow, holy cow, well welcome. It's good to have you here. Are you guys having a good time so far? Are you enjoying it? It's a lot of fun. It's a great event. All right, well, let me get into a little bit about uh, what we're doing. So I'm going to be talking to you about this, this concept of um, the establishment in terms of media and the fact that they are truly not uh, waging a war of ideas. That today, in this day and age, they're actually waging a war against ideas. In order to get to all that, though, I need to begin by introducing myself to you. My name is Ben Swan. I am a broadcast journalist. I've been doing it for 20 years. Uh, and my story is basically this. I've worked for uh, major uh, news media outlets all over the United States, in Texas and Ohio and in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, worked for Fox, CBS, and NBC. I was actually a, a videographer also for ABC. I can throw that one in there too, just so we could round it all out. Um, and then I've also won a whole stack of awards, two Emmys, three Edward R. Murrow Awards, um, tons of Texas and New Mexico AP Awards, uh, Georgia Broadcasting Awards, the list goes on and on. And the reason I, I bring that up is because, first of all, I, I'm not a big believer in awards. I think awards are pretty much political garbage. I, I don't really like them. Um, but I bring them up because we live in a culture where people dictate, some, for some reason, value to whether you've been recognized by your peers. So there you have it. Uh, in terms of independent media, um, so many of you may know me from my Truth in Media project. We started that about five years ago when I was in Ohio still. Uh, it was an independent project. And then through that, we also have done something called Reality Check. How many of you ever see, have ever seen a Reality Check episode? Okay, so, oh, okay, about half of you, good. That means the other half of you are gonna have to immediately, when we are done here, pull out your phone and you're gonna have to search Reality Check with Ben Swan and watch it because it will blow your mind. Completely wake you up from, from things. Now, if you're at Anarchapulco, you're probably pretty woke, as it were. Um, but it's great stuff to send to your friends and family who are not awake, right? It's content that is delivered in a way that's uh, pretty much establishment style, but we talk about things you're never going to hear on establishment media. Um, and then I want to talk to you a little bit about crypto freedom today, because as I mentioned a year ago, I was here uh, talking about my uh, sponsorship with Dash digital cash, um, which went on for about four months, and then with smart cash after that, which we had for about four months as well. So um, they've been incredible relationships. So the, the fast version of my story goes like this, 20 years in broadcast journalism, um, and as part of that process, 
I found myself uh, for a lot of years just working a job in media. That was what I did. I was a broadcaster. I, I kind of wanted to be a, a host for Fox News eventually. That was kind of my dream at one point. The other side of it was to you know, do hosting, as they say, uh, which is basically what you know, someone like a Ryan Seacrest would do. Um, and so for a long time, that was kind of my interest in things. And, and for about eight or nine years, um, that was really kind of my focus. I didn't get into journalism because I had a burning desire to tell stories and, and to get into truth. Um, I did it because I got married when I was 20 years old um, and had two little girls and needed a job. And that's why I got into TV. It's not a great story of someone who is like deeply trying to, to shake, shake the world, right? That wasn't my reasoning for it. Um, and I spent a lot of years just doing kind of uh, general broadcast media. And then in 2008, 2009, uh, my view of things shifted a lot. And that had to do with the fact that I was working on the Texas Mexico border. That's where I grew up, that's where my wife grew up. Um, most of our kids you know, grew up there for most of their lives. Um, and I was, a, I was a journalist there, I was a news anchor there, I, was, I had worked for Fox there for a long time and for NBC, and had covered border issues for a long time. And then in 2008, 2009, the drug war in Mexico came to the city of Juarez, uh, and it was an incredibly violent war that took place there. And we, and we were watching thousands upon tens of thousands of people die every year in that city in brutal, violent way, so violent um, that at the time, Juarez was the most dangerous city in the world, even more dangerous than Baghdad. And at the time, in 2008, 2009, there was a lot of fighting still going on in Baghdad. And so it was, it was an incredible time. Um, and as I was covering what was happening there, the, the networks began to send down reporters and, and journalists to cover what was going on there in, in Juarez. And what I saw as I would watch their coverage is that a lot of the information they were giving was wrong. Surprise. But I actually was surprised, right? Because I was working for an NBC station and my understanding was, look, there's just, well, there's what's going on. There's obviously context to stories and details to stories, but they're, they're pushing these ideas that were untrue. And so I began to email and contact the producers of those segments. Uh, who were working for NBC and Fox at the time and saying, hey, listen, you know, I understand you guys have correspondents here, you're covering what's going on here, and that's great, I'm glad that you're here, but I go over every day. Like, we would drive over every morning into Mexico, and many times we drive across and there would be a, a line of, of headless bodies hanging from an overpass, right? That's the first thing you'd see when you go in. And then we would, we would cover just the horrific things happening there. And I would say, so I, I'm there every day, and I understand you guys are trying to cover it from someone who hasn't really been here. I would love to be able to talk to you guys about what we're seeing, because the way that you guys are telling this story is, is incorrect. And didn't get emails back, didn't get responses, didn't have them say, oh, you know, we think we know what we're doing, or, you know, we're not, we're not really interested, or tell us what you have. There was just no response at all. And it went on for some time until I realized they weren't ever going to respond, because... For the first time, I realized that there was a narrative that was coming from the network, and it didn't matter what was actually happening. It didn't matter who was being affected. It didn't matter the spiral of violence that was taking place. The narrative they wanted to push was going to be pushed. And so for me, there was a lot of awakening that happened during that time. The other thing that happened was that my, my wife said, um, we're going to need to leave here because you're going to get yourself killed. Um, and she got really tired of me being, going over every day and covering what was going on there. And, and my agent called me and said, there's an offer for you to go to Cincinnati, Ohio, to the Fox station there. And I was like, this is sounding awful. But my wife said, I think we need to go. And so my kids wanted to go, and so we decided to go ahead and, and try something new, and we went there. Now, I went from covering the most violent, most dangerous city in the world, which was pretty exciting, to moving to maybe the most boring city. <laughs> in the world in Cincinnati, Ohio. And if anyone here is from Cincinnati, no offense to Cincinnati, because we actually loved Cincinnati. It was an incredible time in our lives. It was great for our kids and, and for our family. Uh, but it is not exactly a place where, uh, you know, investigative journalists go to grow, right? It, it was, you know, this, you're covering um, house fires and car crashes all day long and city council meetings. But I did have a boss who came to me at one point right after I got there and said, hey, you know, anchors, news anchors, um, need to have franchises. That was the thing at the time. This was 2010. They need to have franchises. 
some specific segment they do so that people you know, know that they're more than just a talking head. And so we, we're going to give you a franchise. And we had, they had a list of four franchises for me. And they said, um, the first one is Pothole Patrol. I'm not kidding. Pothole Patrol. You get to go out and cover potholes around the city and see if we can get them filled. Uh, and then there were a couple of others. And at the bottom, there was one called Reality Check. And I said, well, what's that? And they said, well, they do it in Minnesota, a little station there. And they showed me a clip of it. It was basically Michelle Bachman Bash. Right, so Michelle Bachman, who was the congresswoman from Mich uh, Minnesota, it was basically just fact checking her, which, you know, is like shooting fish in a barrel. It's pretty easy. Um, but they wanted me to go ahead and, and take a look. I said, well, I'll do that one. Well, it just so happened, this happened in the beginning of 2011. Towards the end of 2011, we started building this franchise. But Ohio, which I didn't know coming from West Texas, isn't just a, a heavily political place. It is the swing state of all swing states. And it is the place where every potential presidential candidate, every presidential candidate, every person who has any interest whatsoever in being connected to uh, the White House will not only go once or twice or three times or a dozen times, but it becomes this, in this incredible place where um, it, politics is just consumed there on a regular basis. And so reality check kind of took off because in 2011, the Republican primary season really heated up there, and we got to interview all the different candidates who were, who were running for president. And one of those candidates was a guy by the name of Ron Paul, Dr. Ron Paul. Yeah. He's going to be here in a couple of days, right? And uh, I remember that, that we were covering what was happening uh, in, this, in this election, and one of the ideas was we're going to do a profile on each of the Republican candidates. And we went through each one, and we, we covered every single one of them. We covered Jeff Bush, and we covered, I'm trying to remember who was running, Mitt Romney, and we covered Rick Santorum. Everybody got their shot. And then we got to the very last one, and, and I did a piece, and it was called, What's So Wrong With Ron Paul? I actually didn't know anything about Ron Paul, even though we're both from Texas. He's from the other side of Texas, which is probably further away than Ohio. Um, and, and so he was, uh, I did a little piece about him, and we just covered some of his positions, and some of the things he believed. And the next morning, uh, I wake up, I had about 900 Facebook fans. I remember specifically it was 999, because I had interviewed Herman Cain, and we made fun of his 999 plan and used Facebook for that. That's the only reason I remember. But um, the next morning I wake up, and I have 6,000 Facebook fans. And I was like, what the heck? And there were all these crazy-looking people with black things over their eyes. And so it, it started asking people, like, what's the deal? And you know, who are all these people? And they're like, I can't believe that you would... You would uh, talk about Ron Paul on TV, it was so incredible. And, and there's a media blackout, that's why we all cover our faces, because there's a blackout in the media, which I was like, it's not true, that's not true. Uh, there's no blackout of Ron Paul. And then they would say, no, there, there is a blackout, look at the way you guys cover it, look at the way that Fox covers it. So I started looking at it and kind of actually, okay, let's look at the polls, and when they would do polling, and who's in first place, and then who's in third place, and who's in fourth? Wait a minute, why do they remove second place? And I actually look at the poll. Ron Paul's name is there, right? And so for me, there was this incredible awakening of not just what I had seen in, in covering the stories in Mexico, but now seeing what was happening in politics and how corrupt not only the political system is, but how corrupt the media is in being complicit with that political system that it actually becomes an arm of the political parties. And so for me, there was a huge awakening. I credit my awakening to Dr. Ron Paul more than any other person to completely shift the way that I think. I hope for those of you who have been awakened by him, you understand that concept, right? It was just an incredible thing. And so for me, it became a, a push of, well, it's not just about Ron Paul. It's about things that he talks about that don't get covered. And if there are things he talks about that can't get covered, what else can we not talk about? What else can we not cover in media? And so over the next five years began a process of me shifting through and working through what that looked like and what that process looked like. And it, it's been an incredible process. Um, and then I ended up in Atlanta uh, working for the, the uh, CBS station there in Atlanta. And as I was doing that, uh, Reality Check came there with me and it really blew up there. It became uh, incredibly successful. We did 110 million video views in one year, uh, the, the stuff that we were doing there. We would compare that to what like Vice News was doing, if you know who they are. We were absolutely crushing them. I mean, there were so many tens of millions of people consuming our content and, and listening to it. And then all of a sudden, um, in the beginning of January 2017, everything got shut down. And because we, we covered some very controversial stories. 
you may be familiar with some of those stories, right? But as that happened, you know, as we covered some of those stories, um, I was basically hit with an ultimatum. Shut it all down or go find a new place to work. Um, and, and was really stuck at that point. And so I said, okay, I'll shut it all down. So I shut it down. And for one year, it was completely shut down where I looked for a way to bring back the project that I was working on. And then at the end of 2017, I was approached by some guys from Dash and Dash Digital Cash who said, hey, we have a treasury system that's used to fund projects that promote the coin. You should put in a bid. And so I did, I, I put in a bid. And so I put this bid forward and it was accepted and we began off and running independent again using Dash. And as I mentioned to you before, we did uh, four, um, four months with them and then we switched over. We were with Smart Cash and some four months with them. But what happened with both of those coins is that it, it opened up this whole concept, this whole idea to me of a treasury, of a treasury system. Because for us, our funding was coming through a, a crypto that had a treasury, but actually Dash and, and Smart Cash don't have treasury systems designed specifically for this, right? Their treasury systems are designed for their coins. And so out of that was born, um, let's see if I can advance. Turn which one? Point to my right. <laughs> and then, and you guys, there it is, okay. And then, uh, it opened up this idea. So one of the things that happened in 2018, as we were under this, this deal with, with uh, Dash and Smart Cash, we came across this problem that began to happen too, which is that independent voices in media started being purged. Facebook started purging everyone in 2018. Twitter started removing users. YouTube started banning users because there was a shift that took place. See, from 2012 until 2016 or so, there was an incredible growth in, in the market of independent media, but especially on social sites like Facebook and YouTube and Twitter because the average person decided I no longer need to go to the mainstream media to get the information I need. And they were able to cultivate and gather information from independent media through these platforms. Well, in 2016, after the presidential election, whether you like Donald Trump or you hate Donald Trump, the bottom line is that mainstream media worked very, very hard to prevent Donald Trump from becoming president. So much so that they were so convinced he would not be president, they said he was losing by 15 points the day before the election. And then he wins. And so the shock for a lot of people in media was, wait a minute, we don't actually know what's happening. We have no understanding of what's taking place. But above them, remember I said before, the connection between media and politics. Politicians and those who control politics in America also looked at that and said, we need to get control of what is happening with media in this country. And so the way they've done that is under the guise of the lie of Russian influence in the election which did not influence the election, they have pushed this idea, right? It's garbage. They have pushed this idea and moved it forward to say, well, we're going to uh, purge all these dissenting voices. So I'm really short on time, um, but let me just tell you a little bit about what we've done. So we have actually tried to create uh, a new system. I'll skip it, I'll just tell you about it. Um, and it's called Isagoria or Ice Media. And I'll, I'm going to be around this afternoon. I'll be out, outside and I'll be talking to you guys about it if you're interested. But Ice Media is essentially, the concept is, we are creating a, a, a decentralized blockchain-based platform on which to give independent media a home. Give them a place uh, to be able to uh, cultivate content, documentaries, docudrama, news, to create a 24-7 streaming channel to create a platform channel similar to YouTube that allows those voices to be heard there, but to also create a treasury system that funds independent media. And so that is the concept that we're working on right now because again, the, the basic concept for us is this. There's not a war being waged of ideas anymore. There's a war against ideas. There's one narrative that is allowed in politics, one narrative that's allowed in media, one narrative period. And I believe that I don't have to agree with you to fight for your right to speak. I believe that all of us should be fighting every day for voices we agree with and for voices we disagree with in order to have a robust debate and robust media landscape that challenges ideas and that shakes the narratives that right now are not leading us toward freedom, but lead us toward tyranny. Guys, I'll be outside. I thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Oh
Coco is so hype, I'm trying to tell ya This the event of the year and best vacation ever Rhymes part of Jeffrey Tucker, just to name a few Get your tickets, you don't want to miss it You should roll through, talking politics to health and self-improvement to investing So many things, not one thing, learn how to live life unchained, yeah Four days vibing on the beach, time to connect, all about growth Way more than a conference, this is Anarchapoco, yeah Let's go. You ain't seen nothing yet.